What's up? It's Kaylee Cuoco. When it comes to travel, we all have a happy place. I just went to my happy place. I just went to Maui, and it was truly amazing. Priceline has always been about getting you to your happy place for a happy price with deals you really can't find anywhere else, like up to 60% off select hotels in Costa Rica or five-star hotels for two-star prices in Cabo. Go to your happy place for a happy price. Go to your happy price, Priceline. Rex Sherman is a demon that walks among us. A predator that ruined families. The Lisk podcast team was shocked by the recent news of Rex Howerman's arrest in connection with the Gilgo Four murders. After more than a decade of searching, law enforcement officials finally pieced together enough evidence to bring formal charges against him. I'm your host, Chris Moss, and the Lisk podcast will be releasing new episodes every week to unpack how Howerman was caught. We'll track developments in the case, as well as conduct interviews with officials and witnesses familiar to all the troubling details. We are relieved by the arrest, but with new information coming to light every day, there's still so much to learn. Look for new episodes every week, and if you haven't already, please listen to seasons one and two of Lisk Long Island Serial Killer, wherever you listen to podcasts. Slow Burn Media and Evergreen Podcast presents Who Killed, a podcast that provides a voice for the voiceless. I've been waiting for 12 years to be retried, and I wish to be retried because Mr. Bailey, F. Lee Bailey of Boston, is going to vindicate me and prove my innocence in court. However, the question is that I fear for my wife's health for the ordeal that she must go through on top of the ordeal she's already been subjected to. This has not been easy on her, and this goes for the rest of the family, including our son, our daughter, our parents in Europe. This is not going to be easy on them. Some of them because they're too young and others because they're too old. But on the other hand, I welcome the chance to prove my innocence, which I will do. I suppose I'd rather defend an innocent man because it's always more gratifying to get a, a positive result for someone who's innocent. On the other hand, the pressure is worse because if you lose the case, you've got to keep appealing it, appealing it, appealing it as long as there's any appeal to try. And it's uh, very frustrating, very depressing to know that someone who is innocent is sitting in jail despite your best efforts. The unseen part of the iceberg is the preparation of the case, which involves investigation. After all, if you have the evidence with you, uh, no amount of advocacy is going to affect the result. And if it's against you, the same is probably true. And if the investigation establishes clearly enough the guilt or the innocence of the defendant, why uh, the man representing him isn't really going to make that much difference. I'm simply a functionary in the system who's obliged to give him the best defense I can. And it certainly doesn't bother me if his guilt is not proven to the satisfaction of the jury. Well, I have very few contemporaries. Uh, if you're talking about people who devote all of their time to the defense of criminal cases, there are only a handful in the country. And uh, some of them that I know I have great respect for. Uh, on the other hand, there aren't a great many lawyers in this country that I would be happy to have defend me if I were in a jam. Tougher the case. That is, the tougher to get a conviction, I suppose, the more competent the prosecutor who uh, obtains one. One of the best lawyers that I bumped into a courtroom, uh, although I don't want to sound chauvinistic about it, is my own classmate, Mr. Kahn, who tried the Strangler and who tried a prior case with me. Uh, the prosecutors in the Shepard and Coppolino cases were both very competent men. But a prosecutor is kind of a different animal than a defense lawyer, and I think it's... Uh, very hard to compare them as trial lawyers or advocates. Their expertise is different, their whole mode of operation is different, and uh, they tend to melt into a general category. I think you'd have a great deal of trouble remembering from American history one famous prosecutor, whereas there are numerous uh, defense heroes whose names will probably never be forgotten. Hello and welcome to this week's episode of Who Killed? I am your host, Bill Huffman, and this is a Slow Burn Media, Evergreen Podcast, and Killer Podcast production. On this week's episode, I will be taking you back to where it all began, Bay Village, Ohio. 
And no, we are not talking about Amy this week, but another unsolved murder, and that is the case of Marilyn Shepard. And according to Case Western Reserve Law School, the Shepard murder case assumed legal importance when Dr. Samuel Shepard's 1954 conviction for the murder of his wife was set aside by the U.S. Supreme Court on the grounds that the defendant was not sufficiently insulated from the excessive publicity surrounding the case and thus was denied a fair trial in Cuyahoga County Common Pleas Court. This decision helped define what protections from adverse media coverage were necessary under the 14th Amendment to the Constitution. Now, it has been nearly 67 years since the awful murder of Marilyn Shepard. The 1954 beating death of Marilyn, along with the arrest and conviction of her husband, still resonates with the community today. And according to Thought.co, Sam Shepard was actually voted most likely to succeed by his senior high school class. He was athletic, smart, good-looking, and came from a good family. Marilyn Shepard was attractive, with hazel eyes and long brown hair. The two began dating while in high school and eventually married after Sam graduated from the Los Angeles Osteopathic School of Physicians in September 1945. After he graduated from medical school, Sam actually continued his studies and received his Doctor of Osteopathy degree, and he went to work at the Los Angeles County Hospital. Now his father, Dr. Richard Shepard, and his two older brothers, Richard and Stephen, also were doctors, and they happened to be running a family hospital and convinced Sam to come back to Ohio in the summer of 1951 and work with the family practice. Now, by this point, the couple had a four-year-old son, and that was Samuel Reese Shepard, who went by the name Chip. And with a loan from Sam's father, they actually purchased the first home. And the home was overlooking Lake Erie on Lake Road in Bay Village. And they settled into the life of being a married physician suburban family. And... Marilyn, she was a mother, been a homemaker, and she even taught Bible classes at Methodist Church. But, as with all couples, there were issues. Despite the couple enjoying sports together, and they spent their leisure time playing golf, water skiing, and having friends over for parties. And to most, Sam and Marilyn's marriage pretty much seemed free of any issues. But... The marriage was suffering due to a little bit of Sam's infidelities. And unfortunately, Marilyn knew about this. And basically, according to Sam Shepard, although the couple had experienced problems, divorce was never discussed. And they were actually working to revitalize their marriage. And that is when, of course, tragedy struck. The chronology that was mostly used in this retelling comes from The Mockery of Justice, the true story of the Shepard murder case by Cynthia L. Cooper and Sam Reese Shepard, which was published in 1997 by Penguin Books. Nova Online also is a resource for this episode, along with articles from the New York Times, Chicago Tribune, and of course, the Associated Press. So I want to take you back to the evening of Saturday, July 3rd, 1954. According to reports, the night had been a pleasant one at the home of Sam and Marilyn Shepard. Friends from their neighborhood, Don and Nancy Ahern, and their two children joined the Shepard family for drinks and a casual dinner. And from a screened-in porch, the Shepards and Ahern's finished dinner, watched the sunset over Lake Erie, and then Don took his children back home and then returned to the Shepard's house for a late-night movie. And... This is when they turned on Strange Holiday, and it was one of the two available television channels at the time, just to give you an idea of what 1954 was like. And according to the Aherns, Marilyn sat on Sam's lap until Sam had apparently had enough of her sitting on him and having spent the day at work, decided to move to a day bed where he eventually fell asleep. And this is when Marilyn showed the Aherns the door. And it was early in the next morning that Marilyn Reese Shepard was murdered by a severe 
and I mean severe beating, while in her bed. And to make matters worse, she was four months pregnant. On the morning of Marilyn's murder, Bay Village Mayor Spencer Hawk and his wife Esther had received a call from Sam. Quote, For God's sake, Spen, get over here quick. I think they've killed Marilyn, he told the couple. It was shortly before 6 a.m. when Bay Village Mayor Spencer Hauck and his wife Esther had arrived at the Shepherd home after receiving that phone call. And just after 6, the first officer, Fred Drenkin, had arrived at the Shepherd home as well. And all this happened while their son Sam Jr., who was 7, was sleeping in the next room. Now, between 6 and 7.30 a.m., police officers, relatives, press, and neighbors make their way through the house. So, needless to say, the crime scene was not secured. Chip was taken to his uncle's house by Richard, and Dr. Sam Shepard could be seen in obvious pain and was sent to his hospital, Bayview Hospital, which was only a few miles down the road. And this was around, I don't know, 6.30 or 7.30 a.m. when he was sent to the hospital. And then it was around 8 a.m. when the coroner, Sam Gerber, arrived. Now, for the next six hours, they kept Dr. Sam Shepard under sedation, and he was being treated for shock and neck injuries, which he said resulted from his struggle with an intruder. Now, he was visited, despite being under sedation, several times and interrogated by the coroner, coroner's investigator, local police chief, two Cleveland police officers, and Bay Village police. And by mid-afternoon, Cleveland police officer Shockey tells Shepard, quote, I think you killed your wife. Now, Shepard had maintained his innocence despite questioning by officials and newspapers, particularly the Cleveland Press and its editor, Louis Seltzer, demanded his arrest and that the Shepard family was conspiring to shield Sam from the authorities. The publicity intensified with Shepard's arrest of and continued through his nine-week jury trial, and it was presided over by Judge Edward Blythen. Now, Shepard's home was sealed and closed off to the family until the case was closed. Now, according to FamousTrials.com and many reports from the scene, when Sam was asked about what had happened, Shepard offered a mumbled and on the face of it, improbable account. Shepard said that he was sleeping downstairs on the daybed when he heard Marilyn shout, Sam! According to his story, which he repeated later to police officers, Shepard ran up the dimly lit stairs to their bedroom where he saw a white form standing in next to his wife's twin bed. He grappled with the form, but was hit on the back of his neck and lost consciousness. When he came to, he took Marilyn's pulse and determined her to be dead. After checking Chip's room next door and finding his son sleeping unharmed, Shepard ran downstairs where he saw the form again, this time running out the back door leading to the Lake Erie shore. Sam said he chased down the form, down the stairs, toward the lake, and again battled with the tall, quote-unquote, bushy-haired man. Now, Sam described what happened after he lunged or jumped and grasped the form on the beach. Quote, I felt myself twisting or choking, and this terminated by consciousness. When he revived in the breaking dawn, wet and somehow now missing his t-shirt and watch, he went back into the house and called Mayor Hauk. Shepard remained vague about many details, and he didn't know how many intruders were in the bedroom when he first was injured, and he couldn't even be certain of the sex of the fighting form, calling the intruder a biped in one interview. He attributed his inability to get more specific to the effects of having been knocked out twice. Sounds fishy, doesn't it? On July 7th, 1954, Marilyn Shepard was laid to rest. Now, unfortunately, because of all the press coverage, her son, Chip, was actually not able to attend. And the same day as the funeral, the county prosecutor criticized Dr. Shepard for refusing to permit immediate questioning, although, as I mentioned before, he gave an account soon after the murder. Now, this is when the pressure of the press became pretty much impossible to ignore for the community and investigators. 
And on July 8th, 1954, they put out a headline that read, quote, Testify now in death. Bay doctor is ordered. One of hundreds of articles, many with untruths or inadmissible information, printed in the next few months. So the following day, another front page story and more pressure. Quote, Dr. Box at lie test. Shepard leads a contingent of officers through the house, showing them what occurred. At this point, it's becoming clear that the press is very adamant that Sam is involved. It was on July 10th, 1954, that Shepard voluntarily gives a formal statement taken at the Cuyahoga County Sheriff's Office with several officers in attendance. The reporters must have been on vacation because it would be another 10 days before it was back on the front page with the July 20th, 1954 front page editorial. Quote, someone is getting away with murder. This was how the editorial team pressured the investigation. And they kept it up. Just the next day, on July 21st, 1954, the front page editorial in bold letters, said, Why no inquest? Do it now, Dr. Gerber. As the pressure mounted, Dr. Gerber finally called for an inquest. And so on July 22nd, 1954, they started what was a three-day inquest that was staged in a local gym to accommodate the large crowds, as well as the reporters, live television, and radio crews. Dr. Shepard was searched in full view of the crowd, and Dr. Shepard's lawyers were not permitted to participate and were ejected altogether when they tried to introduce evidence. So on July 23, 1954, police formally take over the investigation from the Bay Village Police, and for the first time, they send out their scientific investigation unit. Now another mistake by the press came on July 26, 1954, with the headline, Police Captain, quote, urges Shepard's arrest. Two days later, the headline read, Why don't police quiz top suspect? The press at this point began to put everything on the line. And on July 30th, 1954, they asked on the front page, quote, Why isn't Sam Shepard in jail? Lo and behold, at 10 p.m. that night, Dr. Sam Shepard was arrested and taken to suburban City Hall, where hundreds of newscasters, photographers, and reporters had awaited his arrival. And at this point in the case, it's already a media sensation, and national newspapers begin running massive coverage, including cartoons, editorials, rumor, and everyone's favorite innuendo. And then on August 16, 1954, a judge finds no evidence and actually releases Dr. Shepard on bail. Now, this kind of is shocking, but literally the next day, Dr. Shepard is indicted for murder and the grand jury foreman, Bert Winston, complains that members of the grand jury were under enormous pressure. Dr. Shepard is rearrested, and again, this is his last day of freedom for nearly 10 years. Sam would remain in jail, and in October of 1954, another editorial criticized the defense counsel's poll of the public to show local bias for a change of venue motion, saying it, quote, smacks of mass jury tampering. On the morning of October 18, 1954, jury selection for Dr. Shepard's trial does begin, and the courtroom is outfitted with a long table in front of the bar, three feet from the jurors, for seating of 20 press representatives. Three of four rows of benches are actually assigned to the press. All the New York news media, Chicago media, press syndicates, they all had representatives, including quote-unquote star reporter such as Dorothy Kilgallen. Now, representatives of news media used all rooms on the courtroom floor and with private telephones and telegraphic equipment installed. Radio stations set up broadcasting facilities on another floor next to the jury room. So as you can see, this is really getting out of control. The courthouse has been set up as a media control center, and basically it's at this point that everything is kind of out of the defense and prosecutor's hands. I mean, it is definitely being run by the press.
Here's another mistake by the media, because on October 19th, they ran a radio debate that was broadcast live in which reporters accused Dr. Shepard of trying to block prosecution and assert that he conceded his guilt by hiring a prominent criminal lawyer. Then continuance of the trial is denied. So on October 23rd, 1954, a front page two inch headline, but who will speak for Marilyn calling for, quote, justice to sham Shepard out of control. October 28th of that same year, the jury is finally sworn in and the first day of trial consisted of massive coverage and the jurors visit to the Shepard home. And that was probably an interesting experience. The biggest issue that I find with the case at this present moment is the fact that the jurors weren't not sequestered. They had their names and photos and papers over 40 times. But for whatever reason, they aren't questioned about what they might have heard. So police, prosecutors, witnesses, the judge, juror, families give interviews and appear on camera. Trial transcripts were made available and reported daily. On November 21st, 1954, a radio broadcast calls Dr. Shepard a perjurer, comparing him to Alger Hiss. The judge refuses to question the jury about whether members heard it. The press kept digging holes for themselves at this point when they published on November 24th, 1954, an A-column headline saying, quote, Sam called a Jekyll Hyde by Marilyn Cousin to testify. Shockingly, no such testimony is ever presented. And as if things weren't salacious enough, during a November 1954 national broadcast, Walter Winchell reports that a woman under arrest in New York was a Dr. Shepard's mistress and had had an illegitimate, illegitimate child with him. Now, two jurors admit having heard the broadcast, but the judge takes no action. And guess what? The report is false. Then, on December 9th, 1954, police step right in it and issued a press statement calling Dr. Shepard a quote-unquote bare-faced liar. That's not going to sit well with the appeals court. The case was finally put to rest on December 16th, 1954, and the prosecution was seeking guilt of first degree with the penalty of death in the electric chair. Let's take a moment at this point to hear from this week's sponsor. This episode is sponsored by FX's American Horror Story, Delicate, starring a female-led ensemble cast, which marks the highly anticipated return of fan-favorite Emma Roberts to the franchise. Delicate also will be introducing some fresh blood, featuring Kim Kardashian in a role that was specifically written with her in mind, along with Cara Delevingne, who will both be joining the AHS family for the first time. FX's American Horror Story Delicate Part 1 premieres September 20th on FX. Stream on Hulu. All right, we're back. So between December 17th and December 21st, 1954, the jury deliberated. And the jury is actually sequestered for the first time. But there are no female bailiffs to take care of the five women jurors. And jurors are actually permitted to make unmonitored telephone calls home at night. Chaos outside and around the jury room prevailed, and the prosecution led by John J. Mahone presented evidence which included analysis of bloodstains found in the house and used Shepard's affair with Susan Hayes, a former lab technician at Bayview Hospital, to establish a motive for murder in what was called a carnival atmosphere the defense led by William J. Corrigan Sr. failed to convince the jury of Shepard's innocence, and he was convicted of second-degree murder on December 21, 1954, and sentenced to life in prison, where he actually would continue his efforts to secure his release. As if there was any doubt on whether or not Sam was guilty, that was ended by the jury's decision. As I mentioned, Sam continued to fight this wrongful imprisonment, as he claimed. At this point, you could have claimed that this was the trial of the century, because in all reality, it really was. I mean, you had media from every different major market in the city of Cleveland broadcasting about this case daily to 
to say that it was influenced by the press is just such an understatement. And you'll see why in, as this case moves forward. This was actually the longest criminal trial at that point in American history. Shepard, who had been in jail since his arrest and was sentenced to life in prison, promised to fight until he had no fight left. Actually, the Cleveland police returned the Shepard home to the family after the case was closed. Now, the historic home of Sam Shepard's parents, which is where he was arrested 26 days after the murder, on January 7, 1955, Ethel Niles Shepard, which was Dr. Shepard's mom, committed suicide by shooting herself. And the cards really just kept falling at this point, because on January 18, 1955, Dr. Richard Allen Shepard, Sam's father, dies of a hemorrhaging gastric ulcer and suddenly worsened stomach cancer. Unwilling to accept the guilty verdict, in January of 1955, Dr. Paul Leland Kirk, a California criminalist, visited Cleveland and the Shepherd home. Two months later, Dr. Kirk returned a report that discussed evidence of a third person, blood spatter, and other potential items. In April of 1955, there was a hearing on a new trial in which an affidavit of Dr. Kirk was presented, and the motion was taken under advisement and then denied. The summer of 1955, Sam Shepard is finally moved from the jail in Cleveland to his new home, the Maximum Security Prison in Columbus, Ohio. And that is where he would stay until 1964. So as Sam sat in prison, Dr. Shepard's appeals to the state court were rejected and the denial was upheld. And in subsequent appeals, including one to the U.S. Supreme Court, despite commentary by every reviewing court criticizing the conduct of the trial and the media. Now, in November 1959, things take on a different tone. Richard Eberlein is arrested for larceny, including theft of Marilyn Shepard's ring from her brother-in-law's house. So put a pin in that name as it will come up again. Now, Sam's original defense attorney, William Corgan, died in July of 1961, and this paved the way for F. Lee Bailey to take over the defense within the next year. And yes, that is the F. Lee Bailey from the O.J. trial. He's been around, needless to say, a long time. Now, it seems as if the public was beginning to question the conviction of Shepard at this point, because in August of 1961, the Shepard murder case was published by Paul Holmes, questioning the conviction of Dr. Shepard. Despite the public beginning to question the conviction, tragedy really couldn't avoid the families of Reese and Shepard's. And on February 13, 1963, Thomas Reese who is Marilyn's father, committed suicide with a shotgun. This is the second suicide in relation to this case. Needless to say, we don't know what he was suffering from, but I can only imagine what kind of pain it is to lose your daughter in such a tragic and horrific way, and then to have everything be broadcast daily on the news. I can't think what he was thinking, but I can imagine he was under a lot of stress. So now it was back to court with a new attorney, and on April 13th, 1963, that F. Lee Bailey filed a new habeas corpus petition in the U.S. District Court, prosecution represented by John Corrigan. As with most sensational crimes today, this was, of course, turned into a television series. And on September 1963, The Fugitive, a popular television show inspired by the Shepard case, is launched. As if things couldn't get any more wild in this case, on July 16, 1964, guess what? Dr. Shepard is released from prison after federal district court judge Carl Weinman rules that Shepard was denied a fair trial. Almost immediately following his release from prison on a $10,000 bond, Shepard married Ariane Tabahones. During the trial, 
Shepard somehow landed a new love interest from overseas, a platinum blonde named Ariane. And Teben Hannes had begun correspondence with Shepard from her home in Germany, then traveled across the Atlantic to be able to visit him in prison. Unfortunately, from the standpoint of public relations for Shepard, Teben Hannes turned out to have an older sister who was married to, of all people, Nazi propaganda chief Joseph Goebbels. Shepard's joy was never going to be long-lived because the 6th District's Court of Appeal voted 2-1 to one to reinstate Shepard's conviction. But this time they allowed him to remain free on bail until his appeal to the U.S. Supreme Court. So it was on June 6th, 1966, that the U.S. Supreme Court agrees with the Federal District Court Judge Weinman ruling in Shepard v. Maxwell that the trial of Dr. Shepard was, quote, a carnival, and that Dr. Shepard was denied a fair trial because the judge failed to take steps to control the courtroom atmosphere and prevent jury bias resulting from excessive press coverage. So on October 24, 1966, Dr. Shepard's second and supposedly fair trial begins. This trial did not last nearly as long. On November 16th, not even a month later, the jury finds Dr. Shepard not guilty. Shepard's friend and soon-to-be father-in-law, professional wrestler George Strickland, had introduced him to wrestling and trained him for it. And he actually debuted in August of 1969 at the age of 45 as the killer, Sam Shepard. Shepard wrestled over 40 matches before his death in 1970, including a number of tag team bouts with Strickland as his partner. His notoriety of being a convicted killer did help with the audience draw. During his career, Shepard used his doctor knowledge to develop a submission hold called the Mandible Claw. And then, guess what? That would go on to be made popular by wrestler Mankind in 1996. During the marriage after the trial, Northeast Ohio was basically the place where Shepard's drug and alcohol violence had finally destroyed the Arian and Sam marriage. And she said she was a 32-year-old divorcee and the daughter of a wealthy industrialist. And basically, she wanted to get the heck out of Dodge. So it's just one of those crazy coincidences. I mean, she put $250,000 to his legal battle in 1960s. I mean, that's insane. And again, don't get me wrong. Her father was a Nazi sympathizer and she was a member of the Hitler youth camps and all that terrible stuff that was going on in Germany in the 19. 19- 30s, but Sam was also a raging alcoholic and definitely was a tough person to live with. The two didn't actually meet for the first time until January 24th, 1963 at a parole hearing. It was 18 months later that they were married, and that was, again, two days after he was released from prison. Again, like I mentioned before, Dr. Shepard dies on April 6th, 1970. He was only 46. Dr. Paul Kirk died within a few months as well. At this point, you're kind of left thinking, Sam spent 10 years in jail. He was a raging alcoholic. He had some serious health issues. I'm assuming the time in jail was not good for his health. To think that he only lived another five years is somewhat shocking. And I just think that it goes to show you One, he was a very unhealthy individual, and two, probably wasn't that great of a guy. If you listen to the reports from his second wife, he was abusive. There's been reports that he was abusive to Marilyn as well. We kind of left her here, you know, left here to speculate on whether or not Sam was involved in the murder. But it is very important to note that in. 1984, and this was January, early January of 1984, that an elderly widow, Ethel May Durkin, dies six weeks after being hospitalized for a quote-unquote fall at her home. As I mentioned before about Richard Eberlein, put a pin in that name as well, because that will come back in just a few minutes. 
1974, according to an article from the UPI, quote, Mrs. Shepard auctioned the family possessions in her front yard and moved to the southern part of France to forget about Shepard. She said Shepard was a very mild man when not drinking or using drugs, and she remains in contact with his son Sam and dental assistant and music writer in Massachusetts and with Sam's brothers, Stephen, in California. She returned to Fort Lauderdale, Florida in 1977, then moved to New Jersey a year later and to Bavaria, Germany, for personal business in 1979. She said she will live temporarily with a realtor friend, William Spang, and his wife in the city I live in, Rocky River, and then rent a home with her mother, Hetty Heberman. Mrs. Shepard also said she will look for a job, her first since she handled the office duties of Mr. Shepard, Dr. Shepard. Her autobiography attracted interest, but nobody was interested in actually purchasing it. She said her book was too touchy because she spoke favorably of her membership in Hitler's youth program and likened the organization for Germans under 18 to this country's Boy Scouts. Not the best way of going about marketing your book. She said, quote, it taught us good things. It taught us to love our country, unquote. We were full of idealism. Well, that's a one way of saying it. And Mrs. Shepard's half-sister again married Hitler's propaganda minister, Joseph Goebbels. In July of 1989, Richard Eberling, an interior decorator and the former window washer at the Shepard home, is convicted of aggravated murder and the death of Ethel May Durkin. She had died from a supposed fall. Sam Reese Shepard, the only child of Dr. and Mrs. Shepard, finally speaks out publicly for the first time in 1989. He talks about the injustices that he has suffered and begins an effort to solve his mother's murder. And then March of 1999... Sam actually meets with Richard Eberlein at the Lebanon Correctional Institution in Ohio. And then the blockbuster movie, The Fugitive, starring the one and only Harrison Ford, based on the television series, which was based on the Shepard case, is released. And again, this is a movie about Dr. Richard Kimball, an innocent man wrongly convicted of the murder of his wife. It becomes a Academy Award-winning film. In 1993, Sam Shepard begins to reinvestigate the murder. On October 13, 1995, Cuyahoga County Prosecutor Stephanie Tubbs-Jones announces an investigation into the murder of Marilyn Shepard. Then on February 22, 1996, the first court hearing in over 30 years on the Shepard case takes place before Judge Ronald Suster in Ohio. And then in September of 1997, Dr. Sam Shepard's body is actually exhumed for DNA testing. Six months later, in March of 1998, Terry Gilbert, lawyer for the Shepard family, contends that the results of DNA tests conducted by Dr. Muhammad Tahir of the Indianapolis Marion County Forensic Services Agency exclude Dr. Sam Shepard as a donor of the blood found at the murder scene and point to one Richard Eberlein. Then four months later, on July 25th, 1998, Richard Eberlein dies in prison. In August that same year, one of Eberlein's fellow inmates, Robert Lee Parks, announces shortly before his own death that Eberlein confessed to Marilyn Shepard's murder. And on that note, that is all we have for this week's episode of Who Killed Marilyn Shepard. Tune in next week for part two with Nick from the True Crime Garage podcast as we break down the case of who killed Marilyn Shepard. At the end of this episode, I will include a compilation of news clips from this case. It's about 26 minutes long, and it gives you a pretty decent breakdown from the Associated Press perspective on the case. It includes some interviews with Sam Shepard, 
as well as just an overall perspective of the trial. Again, it's about 26 minutes long, and it is older audio, so it doesn't the best quality, but it is absolutely interesting, and take a listen and tell me what you think, or just enjoy the on-the-ground reporting that was occurring at the time, and again, stay tuned for part two next week. So thank you so much for tuning in this week to episode 99 of Who Killed? And again, if you enjoyed this podcast and my other shows, you can help support independent journalism by clicking on the donate button on the left-hand side of slowburnmedia.com, and that is slow minus the W. You can also contribute to the show via the Venmo app with my username at bill-huffman-3, as well as via PayPal with my email billhuffman123 at yahoo.com and again I will also provide a link in the show notes and really every contribution does help keep these slow burn podcasts running I did receive a very nice donation this week and I am very thankful and appreciative and uh, just want to let the listeners know that when donations are made I do acknowledge them and I appreciate that more than you know so again you can also support the show by leaving a review on apple podcasts or wherever it is that you listen to your favorite shows because those five stars that you do leave uh they keep important cases such as the shepherd case as well as amy's case in the spotlight so if you'd like to stay up to date on the cases that i have covered as well as the new shows i have in the pipeline please do follow me on twitter at Bill Huffman 3. Again, you guys, thank you so much for listening. I appreciate that you have been with me along the way. So until next time, you guys know what to do. That is be healthy and stay safe. Hear Her Sports is a podcast for everyone who loves stories by and about women striving to improve and make a difference in their lives. I am your host, Elizabeth Emery, a former professional cyclist. In every episode, I introduce a female athlete or woman in the business of sport through a thoughtful conversation about who they are and the terrific work they're doing. My guests and I explore the glorious and frustrating issues in sports, history, equity, training, nutrition, and so much more. Join us for inspiration, for community, and for love of being a strong athletic woman. Women's Running Stories, where we explore the intersection between running and life. Because every woman who is committed to a running journey has a story to tell, and this is where you'll find those stories. I am host and producer Cherie Louise Turner. I'm a 53-year-old runner, and together with original music by musician and runner Cormac O'Regan, we bring these inspirational stories to life. Please join us to fuel your adventures.